Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm from uh, IST Austria. Um, maybe many of you haven't heard of it yet. Um, so this is a fairly new research institute um, created a, a couple of years ago in, in Austria, completely from scratch. Um, we have a, a, a only a graduate school, so no, no undergrads. It's focused on, 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 on basically doing basic research. Um, there are three main focus area there. It's uh, uh, formal science, math, and computer science. Uh, we have a lot of biologists there, and there will be uh, physics, chemistry. And the target size of this institute, so at the moment we have 40 faculty. Target size is around uh, 100, which we should re uh, reach in approximately uh, uh, 10 years. Um, and yeah, so I mean also we have, because we're growing, uh, we have a lot of uh, open positions on PhD, postdoc level, um, but also on, on faculty level. So if you want to uh, apply at some point, uh, that would be great. Um, now about this course. Um, so um, what, what, what it will do is, uh, I will in the beginning very briefly introduce the, the, the topic and talk a little bit about general uh, problems and challenges in computational fabrication, uh, of course, with a focus uh, on, on computational methods. Um, and then uh, I will share this course uh, with, with Niloy. And basically, so we'll do it a little bit on, on, on the fly, but um, I, I will focus on uh, basically on deformable shapes, um, how to uh, model and reproduce deformable shapes. And I think uh, Niloy will, will talk about foldable uh, shapes mainly. And then in the end, uh, uh, to, to wrap up, um, we will show you also some um, advanced manufacturing uh, technologies, some, some concepts people are experimenting with, where we think actually there is so far quite little research on, on, on you know, having a deeper understanding of these uh, processes. And uh, we hope that also with this, we will uh, inspire you a bit and, and uh, motivate you to, to maybe work on, on some of these topics. In general, I, I, I just want to quickly highlight that this, uh, um, this course and also this, this field um, is, is actually at the intersection of, of manufacturing, uh, computation, and also interactive methods. And it needs um, uh, actually progress and, and also uh, this interdisciplinarity in, in all these fields to, to uh, come up with new methods and really make, make uh, more beautiful and nice and useful full things. Um, I also want to mention that, of course, this is not uh, the first and only course uh, about this topic. I mean, the field is uh, very broad, and um, there are also already a couple of uh, nice courses that are in the context <coughs> of, of, of graphics and computational fabrication. Um, and if you want to learn uh, more about this field, then uh, this would be one, one natural uh, starting point. Um, briefly about uh, the, the overview. So overall, the course uh, lasts one and a half, half hours. Um, yeah, and I mean, the, the content I already uh, 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 mentioned a bit. So uh, let's start with the introduction um, from, from a very general point. So I mean, first of all, I mean, as you, I guess, all, all, all know, additive manufacturing uh, methods provide really uh, revolutionary possibilities to fabricate uh, geometrically very complex uh, objects, uh, multi-material objects uh, that are useful for, for a very uh, broad, broad range of, of, of areas. And I mean, one is, for example, in engineering, simply to make, for example, these quite complex objects here for creating customized products. Um, there are very interesting applications in the area of, for example, uh, medicine or also bioprinting, uh, a little bit more in the future, um, but also uh, robotics and nanofabrication, just to name a couple of application uh, areas. And now, uh, computational fabrication is basically bringing uh, together uh, these new possibilities on the additive manufacturing side and computational methods to uh, create design and create new products uh, that uh, we couldn't have done, done, done before. And this also brings an interesting uh, change in workflow, and this is actually a cover from, from The Economist. And uh, I, I like this a lot because actually it, it quite nicely illustrates this, this uh, uh, new workflow. So first of all, I mean, uh, due to these advantages, in, advantages in, in, in 3D printing and so on, um, this really opens up a door that, first of all, fabrication can literally uh, happen, happen on your desk. And it also shows quite nicely that um, the user 
uh, is is or maybe the customer is much will be much more uh, involved in 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 this process. So there's really this uh, very uh, a close relationship between the user, uh, computational methods, and, 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 and the fabrication, sort of all, uh, all, all together. And now, I think also, I mean, this means, of course, be because the consumer is more involved, um, we also, I mean, we need uh, new tools and, and good tools for, for modeling uh, content for, 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 for this uh, process. Um, and I think especially there, I mean, compared to the recent developments we have seen in the area of machines and materials, uh, there is still a, a lot of work uh, to be done on, on, on our side. Now, in, in general, w why is it interesting uh, or the right time uh, to look at this uh, topic at all? So, I mean, 3D printing is around uh, for actually quite a long time. I mean, um, the first printer was built, I think, more than uh, 30 years ago. Um, but w what is very interesting, I, I think, now is that um, so there are two big companies and, and a lot of their patents are running out. And, and I, this uh, already on, on the side, for example, of, of, of uh, FDM, so fused deposit position modeling, has, after these patents were running out, it created really, I mean, a lot of startups came out, uh, up, a lot of new machines entered the market, and, and this created really an interesting push. Uh, prices went down. And, and similar <coughs> things um, uh, will happen quite soon. Um, for example, on, on the injection um, uh, printing side, um, and also on, on, on other technologies. So, and also, there are some some very professional other companies like HP and so on also now uh, entering the market. So, I believe in the next few years we will also see a lot of uh, you know nice professional machines entering the market and really. Um, yeah, on, on the manufacturing side, that there are, it will be a lot of very, very interesting uh, hardware uh, that, that, that we can use. Now, uh, the basic principle of, basic of all these machines is actually uh, quite simple. So, I mean, w w what they do, the underlying principle is that they somehow they just deposit some, some material in, in space, uh, these machines. And now I think uh, that what, what, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is um, that now, if you compare this, 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 this uh, additive manufacturing technologies with, with more traditional methods, is um, that, that now um, we have a technology where basically complexity I is almost for free. And what, what I mean by that is, um, if you think about uh, f fabrication, if you want to, for example, 3D print uh, this sculpture here, this inter interlocking knot, um, this is actually uh, pretty straightforward. and, uh, and also, whether you 3D print uh, this sculpture here or, or just a sphere, it's sort of, I mean, it's sort of, you know, similar cost, similar fabrication time. Um, so, so this is this somehow comes comes at the equal cost. And this, of course, with traditional fabrication methods, if you think about milling um, or injection molding or so, this is of course uh, not the case. I think with traditional methods, that might almost be impossible uh, to to fabricate actually. Um, and and so this is actually a, a, a very new, nice new sort of uh, degree of freedom, complexity that, that uh, uh, we, we can use uh, to, to, uh, to explore. Um, so, so some benefits of additive manufacturing is, uh, first of all, it's quite flexible. It's also uh, sort of reasonably fast. I mean, it still takes a couple of hours to, to print an object. Uh, um, but, but nevertheless, this, this, is, this is quite fast. It's, it's very nicely um, suited for, for, for customization. So um, as uh, Pierre said, for example, imagine you walk into a store, not just that you have the scanner that, that somehow designs your bicycle, but maybe you even have the, the metal printer next to it that then you know, prints the perfect uh, frame customized uh, 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 to you. And another interesting thing, I mean, as I mentioned before also, uh, the, this complexity is for free, so you can now come up with uh, very complex geometries, but also with multi-material printers in 3D space, combine uh, uh, materials in a way that was not possible before, and with this also design objects with new functionalities that you were not able uh, to, uh, to create. And so b I want to stress this because I, I think, at least from my personal uh, point of view, actually when looking for, for applications, uh, having you know keeping these advantages in 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 mind, I think is 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 important, because of course also um, 
at least at the moment, I mean, there are also quite a lot of limitations uh, uh, connected to, to this technology. Um, uh, parts need to be uh, qu quite small, actually. Um, you, you have a limit in, in the fabrication speed. I mean, compared to injection molding, where you can you know, fabricate parts at, at, at the rhythm of, 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 of seconds. Here, this will take uh, much longer. You also, you still, you don't have uh, as many materials available as with traditional manufacturing methods. Um, uh, uh, and so on. Also, of course, the cost is much higher. So I, I, I don't think it's a good or, or the optimal way, for example, if you ha have a goal in mind, oh, I, I want to you know, 3D print a pen. I mean, a standard pen, um, I, I think probably this, this, you know, this uh, technology will never ever be uh, uh, competitive. But it opens up a lot of new other interesting uh, applications areas. And I think uh, the community should think a little bit about, about those. So in, in, in general, you know, to really use the full potential of, of te this technology, uh, we need uh, smart software tools and, and pipelines that allow us to uh, model virtual content, but then also smart pipelines that somehow uh, take these virtual models and, um, and map them um, to representation that can be sent to the fabrication device uh, uh, that, that we have in our lab. So Basically, when taking a, a, a step back and, and looking at the state of the art in, in, in creating functional models where we stand uh, uh, nowadays, then, I mean, usually the process starts with shape modeling. So an artist or engin engineer uh, creates a 3D object uh, made out of, 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 of parametric patches, usually. Um, and then at, at some point, when you're happy with, with the shape, Maybe the functionality of the shape is tested in simulation. So you run a finite element simulation, for example. And you know, when you're happy with the, the functionality, um, then what usually happens is um, you take the parametric shape, you convert it into a, a triangle surface mesh, um, and then uh, this mesh um, you send to the printer. And I think that there are a lot of uh, uh, problems with, 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 this, with this workflow. So I mean, first of all, uh, when thinking about the resolution that the printers can can print. I mean, you have uh, 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 trillions of, of, of voxels of, of materials. Uh, uh, how you can place them in in, in space. So, the, the the complexity of the geometry you can fabricate is actually, I, I think, far more complex than what what sort of uh, at at the moment uh, state of the art shape modeling tools allow you to 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 create. Also. Uh, then another issue is because you, ha you have these uh, uh, complex shapes, um, usually simulation uh, uh, takes, takes quite long. And this, of course, uh, prohibits interactive uh, uh, mo modeling approaches. So also there, I think, um, quite a lot of interesting research could be go on to, to speed up the process. And the third a big challenge I see is um, on, on the representation itself. So for example, Imagine uh, you create a mechanical model uh, with gears, uh, like this one here. And this one mi might work perfectly on, on, on your 3D printer. So you have chosen the tolerances carefully so that the model perfectly works on, on your printer. Now when you want to share this model and you know, send it, for example, to a friend so that he can print it, he might have a slightly different printer, which has slightly different uh, tolerances. And, and therefore, very likely, when he prints the same model, it won't work. And so, so there is actually no real, I mean, there is no intelligence in, 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 in this representation. And basically, you have to go back and, and, uh, to the modeling and, 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 and redo uh, some of this stuff. And I think so also there, um, uh, quite a lot of interesting research could, could, could happen. So basically, um, yeah, when, when looking at how, how most of the uh, current 3D printers work, you sort of, you have a direct specification. So what I mean by that is what they really expect as input are, are, are regions. And for, for each region, basically you have a surface mesh, a, cl a closed surface mesh. And for each region, you somehow you need to assign uh, one, one material. And you know, what my, maybe you know, this works well for, for certain engineering applications. But of course, for, for more uh, advanced applications, uh, this, this specification M might not be uh, the best way. I mean, for example, just think about uh, uh, appearance. I mean, something, uh, of course, uh, at least I think much more natural would be to have a more functional representation. If, for example, if you want to build this uh, st statue, that you can somehow say, okay, you know, this model should have 
these kind of uh, appearance properties, this kind of gloss that I want. I want to have it with that kind of texture. And then uh, you have some kind of um, a pipeline that allows it then to go from this functional specification uh, to this uh, direct specification, uh, depending on the fabrication constraints that you have, the, the capabilities of, you, of, of your printer, and then get a model that somehow is as close as possible to the initially desired one, um, but also uh, printable on, 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 on your machine. So this was my, my very quick introduction on, on, on the general uh, uh, challenges. And now I would, if there are no questions at this point, I, I would move on to um, the next part. Are there some questions actually? Okay, then. Um, so the, what I will do in, in the next 30 minutes is I, I will, I will uh, talk about uh, inverse design of, of, of deformable shapes. Um, uh, why deformable objects? I mean, so first of all, I mean, in computer graphics, we know quite well how to, to, to simulate objects, uh, but I think it's um, at least to some extent an, an, an open challenge how to br bring back these virtual models uh, to the real world. Um, and there are also a, a lot of uh, interesting applications, especially, uh, for example, on the, on the robotics side. There's a lot of interest in, 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 in soft uh, robots. Um, and and um, uh, yeah, so I think uh, one interesting uh, application, of course, uh, would, would be, for example, a, as a visionary thing that we can uh, directly 3D print, uh, design and 3D print uh, uh, soft robots. Yeah? yeah? Uh, this one here. Um, so, so this is so this is so far is manually uh, created. It's a silicon hand, and it has it needs is some anas. Yes, it's actuated. Uh, it's actually quite uh, um, a quite powerful hand. So they evaluated it, and you can grasp a lot of uh, different objects with it. And because it's compliant, it somehow very nicely wraps around the object. So you can you know, grasp eggs, uh, bananas, tomatoes, whatever. Um, which is, which is actually quite nice, a uh, nice feature. I mean, with a traditional uh, robotic arm, these objects would be very, very hard uh, to, to, to grasp. But so far, uh, this is manually designed and also manually created. And for getting the anisotropic behavior, they just take a thread and they wrap it around and embed it somehow in silicone and also cloth to, to somehow tailor it in, 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 in that way. Um, okay. So uh, basically what I want to do is now, I mean, I already mentioned to you, it would be nice to have this functional direct to direct specification. And I want to uh, look a little bit how, how one can achieve this uh, for, for deformable uh, uh, objects. And um, yeah, so basically um, um, to, to achieve this, you can actually uh, at the high level control the deformation properties or the behavior of an object uh, at uh, 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 different uh, resolutions. So for example, I mean, there are multi-material uh, 3D printers and um, you can start by, by having a, a wider range of, of, of deformation properties or, or, or control by, by mixing different inks. So for example, you could have use an ink that is rigid and uh, another one um, that, that is rubber-like. And if you dither this uh, together, uh, then with this you can get intermediate uh, sort of mixtures and, and have a wider range. Now, of course, you can go a step further and, uh, for example, borrow some concepts from uh, mechanical engineering. So if you uh, print an object with uh, um, a certain geometry, certain holes, certain microstructures, you again can uh, expand uh, the range of, of, of deformation behavior quite, uh, quite a bit. Then, of course, these microstructures if you think about an object, you can uh, try to spatially uh, uh, combine them um, to even get uh, a, a wider range of, of, of deformation behavior. And um, what you also can do is, um, for example, um, not just that you have these microstructures, but for example, if you have a surface, uh, you can, uh, for example, also start optimizing the surface and, and, and change the local thickness, for example, of the surface also to, to have a, 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 some control of over the deformation uh, uh, behavior. So there is sort of a, a, a wide range of um, different scales of 
uh, methods that you, that you can, uh, or, or properties that you can, can influence. Also, um, recently, in also in graphics actually, so there's qu quite a bit of uh, work has already happened in that, that area um, on, on, on these various levels. And also recently, uh, people uh, got interested in not just looking basically at this, the static behavior of an object, but they also um, started thinking about how can we somehow, for example, embed some pre-programmed uh, uh, behavior uh, into it. And, and some people uh, call this uh, 4D printing. So you have one additional dimension uh, where you try to somehow tailor a material in, in a way that when you have a stimuli, um, then, then, for example, the object uh, deforms in a, in, a, in, a, in, a certain, in a certain way. Um, okay, but um, for now, um, let's start with um, 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 some techniques where we first looked at um, how can you find some kind of microstructures that uh, correspond to a specific uh, deformation behavior. Um, and for this, uh, what you can do, I mean, I, I explained you this, this idea already, is if one, one can look at structured materials. And the idea is basically, um, yeah, by, by somehow trading some kind of uh, geometric resolution, um, you, you, you can, and introducing these structures, you can get a wider range of, 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 of mechanical uh, of, of properties. And I mean, very obvious, if you have all of these objects printed out of rubber, for example, then of course the one on the right-hand side is much stiffer than, one, than the one on the, uh, sorry, the one on the left-hand side is much stiffer than the one on the uh, uh, right-hand side. Uh, yes? Question. Uh, because we're in a geometry conference, <laughs> there is some uh, concept in geometry uh, uh, computational geometry of uh, similar triangulation and rigidity of triangulations in 3D. Is, is that something that uh, in the fabrication technique, because it's known that for what connectivity construction is rigid and what is not, there are some results in that. Um, but then, I mean, I, I would guess, for example, there the, the, the distances would be uh, so kept the same, right? So, for example, you mean for shearing? Or? Right, but so some structures will shear, but for certain triangulation, even if it, is, it would not shear, but it's probably really triangulation. Uh, I mean, some. I don't know if this you know, goes along this line, but there is, for example, some interesting research where people looked at uh, uh, linkages or, or, or um, and, and, and the combination of those. And, and, and for example, there then you, you can transform basically an object from, from one configuration uh, uh, to another one. So there are some people have looked, looked, looked at this. But here in this context, it const context it's really about uh, deformable materials. So, so this is made out of yeah, sort of a, a, a rubber-like uh, uh, um, material. And so basically what, what we what want to figure out is um, in, 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 in that context here, okay, um, yeah, for given a certain kind of um, um, a me mechanical property, so for example, a, a certain kind of elasticity and, 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 and poster ratio, what is the, what is the microstructure uh, that, that allows you to ex exactly reproduce uh, uh, that, that kind of behavior. And there are now uh, there are various uh, techniques how, how you can uh, try to answer, answer that question. And uh, one is one option one can, can look, uh, one can look into is, is topology optimization. Um, and um, so in, in, in the next couple of minutes, I, I want to briefly uh, introduce you uh, to, to, to this, uh, to basically this family uh, of, of, of methods. Um, so, yeah, I mean, b basically the goal or the, the basic question we were looking at is, okay, we want to have a material with a certain kind of uh, behavior. W what is the microstructure? So how does the object need to look like such that I, I can reproduce this behavior? Um, and and for, for this, uh, we're going to use topology optimization. And uh, uh, so basically, topology optimization is a mathematical uh, method uh, that optimizes a uh, material layout in a given uh, design space, such that you uh, 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 approximate or achieve a, a specific uh, uh, objective. Um, 
for example, in, 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 in our case, un under you know, specific um, me mechanical loadings. And it's different from um, um, other optimization techniques that, for example, just allow you to uh, optimize the shape or, or just the size of it by uh, the fact that you, you, you really also have uh, control over the, the, over the topology. And the, 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 this concept is, is uh, around for, for quite some time. So I think, I mean, probably it's not the very first one, but sort of one of the seminal papers uh, was in 1988 by uh, Benzer. Um, and um, already in, in, in the early days, also in industry, uh, they're, they're using uh, this technique. So this is an example from, um, from Airbus, where um, the, the, the goal was to optimize a part of, 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 of their wing. And so basically, they have a certain des design domain, and then they're asking under um, certain low cases, what is an optimal material distribution? Um, they can run one of these uh, techniques um, that then finds this material distribution. And so far, usually what, what, what happened was um, that you, you get an answer from the computer and then an, an engineer somehow interprets this result and maybe you have to, to change it a bit so that you can then uh, really uh, fabricate the part and, 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 and fly with it. Because, I mean, usually they're, they're not uh, unless you don't add them, there are actually not uh, too many restrictions on, on, on the shapes uh, you, you can get. And one nice thing now with additive manufacturing technologies is that even if your computer tells you, oh, you know, create a shape with quite complex uh, uh, geometry, uh, you're still uh, basically fine with it. You can, can, can uh, quite easily uh, fabricate it. So this is actually a quite interesting uh, method in general to, to design or do designs for, for, for additive um, uh, manufacturing. Now, um, let's look at the problem a little bit more, more formally. So the general design problem can be stated as, um, please um, find a material distribution that minimizes an objective function. And this objective function depends on, um, first of all, the, the material uh, distribution. So we have here a density rho uh, for, 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 for the material and uh, uh, the, the state of our, our system. So in, in, in this case here, it's written for uh, um, for some, uh, I think, a compliance minimization problem. Um, so here, uh, basically, you have an object, uh, an elastic object that deforms U is uh, the displacement field. And you have a couple of um, um, uh, constraints. So first of all, uh, it's subject to a, a volume constraint. So you, you don't allow to put a volume everywhere. Because if you search, for example, for an object that is maximally stiff, if you don't have this constraint, then it would just feel um, for example, the entire design um, uh, design space w w with material would have a maximally stiff stiff object. Um, so, if a vol usually a volume constraint, you might have a couple of additional um, uh, in inequalities where, where you can encode some additional uh, d design constraints, and then um, you have here that the case that the material density either should be zero. So, if, if one element has zero, then there it's void. And if it's one, then there is material uh, in it. And also, of course, um, yeah, your, your uh, solution, of course, you know, th this displacement should be uh, physically, physically uh, valid. So in, in this case, if for, for, for elasticity, um, that the forces should be in, in, in balance. Yes? I think there should be one of the constraints you have here that it's not a bond cell or material cell in hanging in air. Like, there should be a connectivity constraint. Um, I, I, I think in this very particular case, it's somehow somehow handled implicitly because you have an upper limit on, on material you can place in there. And if you would place, you know, if we just place some materials somewhere just hanging in air, um, then this structure would be weaker than if you would. Uh, but, but if you change the objective function, then I mean, these, these kind of things might become. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I, will also, I, I will talk a little bit more about uh, other uh, restrictions uh, that, that, that you need to add. But basically, so I mean, this is the, uh, the very basic uh, problem. And now, of course, uh, because you have these discrete materials, 
um, uh, in, in, in this form, it, it, it's, it's hard, uh, uh, hard, hard to solve. So it's a discrete optimization problem. Um, and you know, although, I mean, there, there are some techniques around for, 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 for addressing uh, discrete optimization problems. In, in, in this case, because we usually have really a lot of uh, 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 degrees of uh, freedom. And if you have a larger object, I mean, you might have millions of, 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 of cells or even you know, trillions of, of, of cells in an in ideal case. And solving it you know, directly in a discrete way is, is, is hard. So what people do instead is so there, there, there are many techniques to, to somehow change this problem a little bit and solve it in a different way. Um, one way, um, and this is actually well, um, a quite popular way, is this approach called, called uh, uh, SIMP which stands for a simplified isotropic material with penalization. And the whole idea here is, is basically um, you relax the problem a bit, so you change it from having uh, discrete values. Uh, you allow now uh, for your material densities uh, to be continuous, so they can be between 0 and, 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 and 1. Um, and uh, for doing this, you now, of course, you need some kind of um, interpolation rule or, or, or mapping that tells you, oh, you know, if you have a density in between, what does this really mean on, on the physical side? What kind of material uh, do, 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 you, uh, do you have there? And what uh, 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 people do, for example, in, 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 in this, in the simplest case is they say, for example, okay, I have um, um, my, my, if it's completely filled, um, this is my, this is, this is the, my, uh, Young's modulus of, 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 the, of the field cell, and then I simply multiply this with, with the density to actually get the, the, the stiffness of, 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 a, of a value uh, in, in, in between. And um, there is this uh, uh, parameter p here, um, which um, allows you to control a bit what, what, what happens in, in, in this interpolation case, and in for this very particular uh, uh, problem where you uh, try to minimize uh, compliance, the thing is, so if, if you have a P that is uh, bigger than a 1, then actually in, in this very particular case, the, your solution will actually really converge to a, a discrete uh, 0 or, or, or 1 uh, distribution over time. So you start with, with um, uh, some continuous distribution, and then over time it will, will really uh, con converge. But there is nevertheless a little bit um, black magic involved in how to pick uh, uh, that, that parameter. So apparently, if it's, if it's uh, too high, then um, wh what people say is, I mean, you, your solution will converge very fast, and you will somehow run into a local, a local minimum. Um, and if you, if you choose it, of course, very, very low, then you, you somehow you still have some, some gray values uh, in, in, in between. Okay, but basically, so this is a, um, now a, a, a nice method where we can now you know, switch from something discrete uh, to a gradient-based approach. Um, now, of course, one question is, um, how can you efficiently compute the actual gradients? And uh, one way uh, you can do this is you can uh, use uh, sensitivity analysis uh, with the adjoint uh, method. Um, so basically, the idea is, um, Im imagine here you have um, just your uh, very general uh, objective function um, as before, and you have uh, some, kind of, some kind of residual. In, in, in our case, for example, with, uh, um, with the elastic object, uh, this residual um, simply means that, for example, here, um, um, all the forces, uh, forces should, be, should be balanced. Um, so k times u minus the forces that, that, that should be zero. Um, and now you can, I mean, because you need uh, derivatives, you can just use the uh, 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 chain rule um, to compute uh, uh, the derivatives of, of, of your uh, objective function um, and also of, of, of this residual. And if you look at these uh, terms that you get, um, then some of them are uh, easier to compute but there are some others uh, that are harder uh, to compute. Um, and and, and uh, this one here is a hard one, or, or could be a hard one, because basically the relationship of um, your material density distribution and the state of your system, um, I mean, that could be 
you know, some, something quite complicated, some kind of nonlinear relationship that you need to solve with, for with, 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 with finite element method. Um, but basically now if you do um, uh, uh, a little bit of, of, of reshuffling, uh, what you can do is um, you can uh, use this uh, residual equation um, and look what is this term here and basically um, then just um, insert uh, this uh, trouble term into uh, the derivative of your objective function um, and then basically what you can do is you can uh, solve the adjoint uh, 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 problem and basically get your uh, final uh, sensitivity simply by, by, by plugging this uh, in, in, in here. And so with this you can um, now also um, you have some kind of recipe to compute the, uh, the, 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 the sensitivities, the derivatives in a reasonable way and basically what you now could do is okay you just plug this all into uh, some kind of optimization procedure um, and, and, and hope that it uh, converges uh, to a result and I mean usually it does but there is one uh, remaining problem and that is of, of uh, uh, mesh uh, d dependence. So if you for example want to, um, uh, I don't know exactly what the load cases are but imagine this is some kind of uh, a bridge with, with some load case, the question is how should that uh, object look like so that it's um, as, as, as stiff as possible um, and the thing is now if you increase the mesh resolution you see that, that actually your solution uh, changes. And actually in, in general um, um, this uh, topology optimization problem that I've shown you in the beginning it, it, it doesn't really have a, a, a real solution in the sense that basically um, the more holes you add um, your objective um, uh, function will always ways go down in, 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 in general. Um, so, so this is of course not, uh, not, not desirable. Um, yes? Is there a way to write down a constraint um, of the maximum number of holes or the maximum of genus and then um, incorporate that into the gradient based method? And also, if so, do you get uh, a good global option? Um, so I, I, I don't know if there is a paper that explicitly does this. I mean, may, may, maybe there is. Uh, I mean, there are, for example, some, some methods that, that really look at, um, uh, that for example, um, w w what they do is they somehow they combine a topology topological derivatives with just a, a regular sh shape optimization. So basically they optimize the shape and then they ask, oh, you know, where in this domain do I need to punch a small <coughs> hole uh, to, in to increase my, my, um, my objective functions? So maybe we can use something like that as a, as a workaround for doing it. M maybe there are some uh, elegant methods for, 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 for doing it. So in general, I also have to say, so this fi field is is actually quite quite big. Uh, people in mechanical engineering looked into it also uh, uh, quite a bit. So I, uh, I'm more, uh, you know, I'm just a user of, 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 of this and I, d I don't have the full full overview uh, of, of it. I yeah. Generally, this, when you have the same problem or linear problem, any time you want to put a quality constraint, you can write it with the right way. So I'm asking if you have a Certainly, if you want global optimality, there's no way. This is just almost certainly a deal. Yeah. yeah. If these guys, like in the mechanical engineering, they have a solution, this would be really good for us because many of those solutions we can benefit from. Right. Is the high resolution solution any better than the other one? Because it's not yes. guaranteed. Is it playing off? Like, visually, I, mean, I see more details, and that's nicer. Yeah, yeah also, the objective function goes down. Much like the ratio, for example. I mean, I, 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 I mean, probably at some point it will, will be small, but basically, if you don't do anything, then you know the, the higher resolution is, the more holes you will will get. I think the thinner structures will be where you can get uh, get a little bit less mass because you can imagine if you want to stick the lower one, and if you have a coarse printer, you even if you need a thin one, you need a stiff one. Then they will thick one. Yes. Is the solution uh, 
can you find many solutions with the same uh, objective function or the solution kind of unique here or the, this I cannot tell you um, I, I mean you mean for example if you change the load case a bit will you get the same yeah, the so same structure you need some solution you get another completely different minimum I mean, w what I know is, so I, I don't know for the structural stability, but I for sure know for, for example, for, for the initial problem that I'm, I motivated this method with, that you want to have an elastic microstructure that gives you a certain deformation behavior. Um, there you can have actually uh, many different structures that, that then give you one particular uh, 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 behavior. Yeah, so basically to, to address this problem, there are also that there are quite a lot of papers um, then um, how to do some uh, regularization uh, to actually uh, prevent, for example, quick oscillations of, of the density. Um, one of the simplest formulations that is around is to have a direct filter on, on the se sensitivity values, basically saying, okay, you know, the values um, in, 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 in a certain neighborhood um, local, they should correspond to the, the average of, 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 of the neighborhood. This is one thing uh, that uh, the people do, for example, to, to address uh, this, this, this problem. And so then with this, um, together you sort of, you have the complete um, sort of scheme for, for, for doing uh, 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 topology optimization. So you basically have this, you know how to compute the, the gradients, you, you, you need some kind of uh, regularization for, for um, uh, addressing uh, these mesh dependent uh, 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 pr uh, problems. There are also, by the way, um, just as a side note, there also might be some problems that come due to the discretization or element uh, types that you use in, 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 fi in your finite element uh, simulator. For example, if you use uh, linear uh, elements, linear basis functions, then what, what you will observe is that you, you get a, a sort of some kind of checkerboard uh, if effect. So one, one square is empty, another one then next to it is, is, is filled, and of course physically that doesn't make um, much sense. So you need this kind of uh, regularization or filtering for, 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 for getting uh, uh, suitable results. There's actually one group that is very uh, uh, famous and, and uh, does a lot of great work in, 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 in this, this uh, area uh, fr from Denmark. And also they have uh, a lot of uh, apps ac actually where you can uh, test these, these different methods. One is actually very cool, it's quite impressive I think. There is one that runs on your phone. Um, so um, yeah, if, if, if you want in the evening, uh, download it and you can play around with it and it, it's, it, 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 it's quite cool. So I see I'm, I'm much slower than I, I initially planned. I, I tried to wrap up uh, just that, that part here. So basically, uh, okay, so we, we now we applied that uh, technique to uh, somehow find our uh, elastic uh, um, um, microstructures. Um, so f f for this, basically, uh, yeah, we wanna um, we wanna find a, a structure that has this desired uh, uh, behavior. Um, and for this, we assume uh, we have basically an infinite amount of 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 of, of this material uh, tiled uh, tiled together. Um, and then the question is, how, how does this structure actually need to look like so that it has this uh, desired uh, behavior? Um, f when you do this, for this, you don't need to simulate a huge block, but uh, you have some special type of, of uh, boundary conditions in your simulation, which uh, allows you to only simulate a, a small, basically a single tile of, of, of this material. And then um, in, in, in our case, uh, our objective function is a little bit uh, different. So here we really look for an objective that uh, matches this uh, particular uh, deformation behavior. Um, and if, 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 if we run this optimization for a particular uh, elasticity, for example, here you see uh, how, how, how that evolves uh, o o over time. Um, just make, making a step back, of of course, so in this uh, topology optimization, there is a whole family of method uh, that, that, that exists. Uh, I mean, the one that I have shown you uh, is, is this density-based one. So basically, you have a, a, a grid uh, with, with densities that you optimize uh, over. But people, of course, also have looked at uh, implicit methods um, um, to, to 
yeah, to evolve the, sh the shape and also the topology over time. People also looked at ex ex explicitly at the topological derivatives. So for example, where you need to insert a hole to have a topology uh, change. Um, uh, people also looked at uh, discrete uh, uh, approaches and for some uh, special type of applications, uh, there this actually might might work uh, uh, quite well, and also uh, various uh, combinations of, 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 of these uh, methods. And just for the sake of uh, com completeness, um, so for example, there is, there is one uh, nice work by uh, Panetta and, and colleagues, and they were actually asking a, a very similar question, so what kind of, um, how can I find a microstructure that reproduces a specific uh, behavior? And what they do is to say, okay, I have a, 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 a cell here, and they simply they enumerate all kind of, um, uh, or, or up to a certain amount, uh, uh, topologies uh, that, 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 that you can build in, in there uh, based on, 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 on certain rules and, and some uh, symmetric to topologies. And with this, they end up with a couple of thousand of, of different uh, topologies. And then in addition to that, then they, they run uh, also some kind of shape optimization. So they change the thickness of the struts uh, a bit so that they can really accurately uh, approximate a certain, certain behavior. And with this method or with uh, the method, our method that I've shown you before, you can now build up databases of, of different structures that really cover a wide range of, 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 of uh, elastic, elastic behavior. And um, just to wrap up this uh, part now, Basically, now you, you have a database with different kind of microstructures and, and, and their behavior, but in practice, actually, you want to re probably reproduce an object with spatially varying uh, properties. Um, and there you now have that, that the challenge, uh, okay, you need to convert this virtual model that has now volumetrically these material parameters to the actual microstructures. Um, and of course, uh, as you have seen, you have like different uh, um, structures also that might uh, overlap. So for, for each uh, particular uh, value here, I could go into my database and actually have um, I could have uh, uh, I could have many many different structures that, that gives me you know locally this, 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 the same behavior. And now the challenge is actually how do you need to uh, you know choose locally each structure in a way that uh, globally all the structures are uh, properly connected and also in addition to that also that, that work physically uh, together correctly. I mean if you have paid careful attention in the beginning I've mentioned to you when we search for these structures we actually uh, we assume that we have an infinite tiling of, of, of this material. So we have this homogenization approach that basically says okay you know if I have this particular structure and I, I, I tile it a lot then on average it gives me this particular behavior. Now as soon as you only have an individual structure and you tile it with a different one, you know, this assumption I is actually broken. So you also you need to be careful from a physical point of view how to, how to combine these uh, 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 structures. So basically um, for, for doing this, I mean, we have um, we formulated uh, uh, this uh, problem as a graph uh, labeling problem. So locally we have uh, labeling costs, how well these structures fit. We have some pairwise costs um, how they uh, fit together, and then uh, by solving this problem, we can quite quickly uh, uh, find the individual structures and get an object um, that is now uh, uh, printable. Um, so now we'll skip a lot of uh, techniques. I will just can I have two more minutes actually, um, just as a, a as a as a quick. Uh, um, uh, a sneak peek, actually, because I also promised you a little bit uh, also more more recent uh, research. So uh, this was about how to reproduce elastic behavior of sort of a, a static uh, uh, object. Um, uh, very recently, we uh, also I mean got inspired a bit ab about this work about uh, 4D printing and having objects that can deform over time. And we actually asked the question: Could we? Uh, come up with a very simple fabrication method where you fabricate things in, in flat and the motivation was um, I mean then you can for example use a lot of existing 2D fabrication techniques you can just uh, use screen printing or, 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 or whatever uh, and then once you have this uh, uh, fabricated you can just let the object go and it automatically deforms in, 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 into 3D um, and 
I want to very quickly show you a, a couple of uh, 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 results and how this works. So the idea is simply um, that um, what, what we do is we have uh, these uh, s small tiles and they're actually sandwiched between um, two uh, elastic sheets. And once you let go, um, th this, the deformation energy that is stored in the elastic sheet uh, contracts these tiles basically together and uh, you get a, th a 3D shape. So for example, from, from this uh, flat uh, configuration, you get, get, get this uh, uh, cow. So this is a quick little illustration how it works. So we have these tiles and they have uh, pins and yeah, they're connected to these elastic sheets and basically the configurations, first of all, the sides, but also the, the pins itself allow us uh, to, first of all, control the, the shape that we get in 3D, but also the elastic forces that are happening. And of, of course, in the end, we want or need a shape where all the, the forces in the target configuration are, are, are properly, uh, properly balanced. And I skipped the fabrication part. I show you this uh, later. But this is, for example, another uh, example. So here we just put a plexiglass plate on it and now slowly uh, lifted it. And so you can see here how the shape actually uh, uh, forms. Um, OK, good. So with this, I, I will switch to uh, or hand over to Niloy. And then in the very end, we'll have a, a quick uh, summary with a more, more general outlook. Thanks, Bernd. I should have let Bernd continue because I thought that, that was super exciting to see the actuation and I'd love to see that a bit more. Um, so Bernd contacted me last week sometime and said, why don't you give part of the talk? I said, okay, uh, this is, a, I, I had lots of extra cycles from organizing, so I thought, yes, this will be a great <laughs> idea. Uh, so I will talk about what I call foldable shapes. And uh, this is a little bit different from some of the talks we have heard in grad school so far. Because in grad school, you want to come up uh, with uh, and get exposed to topics, which is very fast growing. And so can, as a PhD student, this is great, right? Unfortunately, I will talk about three results that took us five to six years spacing. So 2007, 2011, and 2017, right? It's just very slow. And it relates a bit to what Keenan was saying before, like if you sometimes work in very classic problem, it becomes difficult to come up with new things, right? And some of them are inside, some of them are computational one, but the general idea is, can we make things simpler? Because I, I'm, I don't like complicated things because I can't do very complicated things. So, so when I was a kid, I used to play a lot with origami, right? So this, I, used, I had these five or six books and I used to play, and there was something that you probably can tell what I'm making already, is um, you can fold these structures, and if you fold the right sequence, you would get, um, in this case, a bird, right? So here's a bird. Um, how many of you have done this bird at some point? Okay, that's good, right? Uh, I folded it in a different way before, so this is slightly different. Yeah, right. Um, how many of you ever played with it enough? Um, I don't know if it's in a book, but know how to make the bird flap wings. Did you ever try to play? This is a test to see how, how much time you was wasting as a kid. Right? <laughs> so so I, don't know, I don't know if it's in book. I, I found at some point playing enough, and hopefully it, it works. So the trick is you have to bend uh, the wings in, in, in a way, and then if you put it at an angle, it starts flapping. Right? So it's very cool. Right? And that's, that's what we will try to do. We will try to make it. Okay. Now, the problem with origami or the not so problem is you can do amazing shapes, right? And there is this amazing software, if you haven't tried, you can try this tree maker, and it, it tells you, it gives the shape, it tells you the origami pattern and the sequence of steps, right? A fundamental thing with origami, and that's why there are books, that you can specify things one at a time. So you fold this, this, so this is a sequential step, right? I'll pass it around, you probably know this, and you can see. Now, if you have, something which is known as curved fold. And since uh, many of us will go to SIGGRAPH very soon, you can see these Disney World, which means instead of straight folds, you just do with curved fold. So this is a curved fold example, right? This is, this is a curve, okay? And I'll just give you some examples of 
careful and keep one of them around and uh, uh, you can play with them, you can destroy them, because we have plenty in my office and we can use them. Okay. Now, the thing with curve fold is, we'll have this one, it's good, is it's easier just to see this is fabrication in a much broader sense. It's fabrication as in not 3D print, something you can fabricate out of material. It is very nice if you can fold things because then there is no explicit joint, so engineering becomes a lot simpler, right? And you can get some really nice shapes out of these. And this is called a curved fold, but the, the beauty comes at a cost that now I have to fold things simultaneously, and this will come back later as we see here. Okay? So, today's talk I'll talk about three things. The first one is if you know things were fabricated in a particular way, in this case with curved fold, then you can reconstruct it. So it links to Pierce talk about reconstruction, right? The second so, uh, one is if you know you were going to fabricate out of paper or glass or something, then the design tool should be different and that's a constraint shape. And the third one is this actuation um, with how can you make things fold, right? And, and I'll tell you some stories as we go along. So if you look closely here at these structures, if these are not designed properly, then you would get these sort of seam lines, right? So you see the texture don't come across, but this is not really texture. This is really metal flaps, right? So, and you can imagine things would go wrong. So I was visiting uh, MIT uh, for a talk uh, also with Bern. Um, and there, if you look at their building, you would see that when there are seams and if they're not out of folds but made of separate sheets, there are gaps, right? And this can cause certain troubles. Okay. Now this is an uh, area that in 2006 or seven, when I was in Vienna, I got ins we got inspired by this um, David Hoffman and Gregory Epps for these ones. For the structures which were built out of single sheets, there is some cuts here, but here this is a single sheet that's folded. And this is called curve folding, as you see here. Okay. So the first question is, if you know that these have been created out of curve fold, what is the flat pattern and what are the folds, right? So this is a reconstruction problem. That given a scan, can we get back this, okay? So the question is, um, this is a scan and the prior is very different now. The prior is, you know, this is developable. This is from a single sheet. Can you get the exact thing out of it? Right? And in the process, you can also get uh, what is the sequence, intermediate shapes, etc. Okay. I need to spend a few uh, comments about general developable surfaces. And there are many experts like Keenan and Justin and Amir here who can add more to this. So in very simple terms, there are three or four items I would need. Developable surface means any change, the geodesic curvature doesn't change, and it starts from a flat sheet so you can fold it, right? Without tearing. So th these are all developable surfaces, okay? So which means this is a characterization, vanishing Gaussian curvature. That means other way to geometrically see it is always there is a K, K1 and K2. One of the K is zero, trivially in a plane is zero. But any time else, one of the k is zero. That means that if you look at it, you would see a straight line. And this is something I encourage you to do. You'd see there is a straight line. That, that turns out to be the ruling. Now, it's locally, developable surfaces are really nice in the sense there are only four things you need to worry about. It's either a plane locally, OK, or a cylinder. This is a cylinder, of course. It's a cone which is here, or you have a tangent surface. So you have a 3D surface, 3D curve, and it's a tangent strip around. Right? That's all there is to locally developable surfaces. Okay? So when you have this non-flat, this is another fancy way of saying these are the three things that can happen, okay? which are the cone cylinders and tangent surfaces. Okay? Now, I already say that if it's developable, it's already a ruled surface. There's a slight um, ad addition to this, which is if it's a ruled surface, that means at any point we have the ruling, which means this straight line that we talked about. But there is an additional property we, we can uh, get this along the ruling. Let's say this is the ruling. At any point, the surface normal is the same. So the, the tangent plane is the same. Okay. 
So this is a very classical, very, very old property. Right. Now, this is my uh, insight in, in this uh, many years of working in, in general geometry processing, that one thing you want to work with, you, you need to get the representation right. If you have the wrong representation, you have to do a lot of extra tricks to get it working. If you have the right representation, it's, it's a lot simpler. And this is a point that Keenan stre stressed a lot yesterday, that you, you've got to have the right representation. So in the case of, of c uh, continuous developable surfaces, we talked about plane, cylinder, cone, or tangent surfaces. This is called a curve of regression. Um, that yellow curve, which just means you take these uh, these ruling directions, the curve, it, it's sort of tangent to. Okay. But in, when you discretize, we have to be careful. So the obvious choice would be, why don't we do uh, triangles? But then if you were at Marcel's talk yesterday, you said, let's use quad. And it turns out quad is right, and you need something else on top of quad. So for cylinder, the quad choices are very simple. You would have these quad strips. For cones, it's not quite quad. You can see this, but these are the triangles. Okay. And we will talk mainly about this general case of these tangent surfaces, etc. And for plane, you can do anything. It doesn't matter. Okay. So the algorithm I is you have a scan, and you want to convert it to this crease pattern right, in a plane or in folded. That's, that's the goal. Okay. So the first thing, the first, um, there's four steps. The first three steps are very dirty and is to initialize the problem. Because whenever you work with real data, it's just very dirty to get started. But we'll use these intuitions that we have built. The first thing is locally, I want to estimate these, um, these ruling directions. Okay? And the way to do is, we, we now know what this ruling is, is that the, ta the, the tangent planes are going to be continuous, the, not the continuous same across along that direction. And you want this direction where the Gaussian curvature is zero. That's, that's what you're looking at. So what you can look at is very locally, you would look for geodesic distance and Euclidean distance. And within some the range, you, you want to find out like if you're going um, roughly in this direction, in this direction, then geodesic distance along the surface and Euclidean distance are going to be similar. So you get a good initialization of where these ruling directions can be. This is very local one. Then you do some gathering to get these strips around this, which are these pink strips, right? This is just a coarse initialization, and the coarseness will come up very soon. Now, there's a work we did before that I will not go into, that for developable surfaces, you can define this in shape space, and you can use that for deforming it uh, to, to flatten it out. But now it's not conformal mapping, because we want to preserve distances. This is isometric mapping, so from here you go to there. Things look very simple so far. And then you can, uh, based on the three types, you can connect these ruling directions to form this. Everything looks like we're almost done. But if you, because you have created a mapping, you can go back. And you can go back. If you, if you, go, if you want to go back with the thing that this should be the conical part, this should be the flat part, this should be the cylindrical part, and regularize, things will not match up anymore. Right? So this is the problem. And this is expected because we only have a coarse initialization. We know that these points should go together, these points should go together, but you can't just brute force send it to an optimization. You have to have the right representation. So let's talk about the representation a bit here. So the representation we will use are what are called PQ strips, or planar quad strips. So it's a strip of quads. Right? So trivially, you can flatten it to a plane because you will just open it. So that's very good. The interesting bit is these rulings and this curve of regression, these are automatically encoded. How? So if we take the strips and extend it, this is my discretization of the curve of regression. That's very good news. Um, I can start naming them. And by construction, the, the tangent plane along this direction or along the ruling is the same. So it's good, right? So this is, I cannot get out of this anymore. And the other important thing is if I subdivide with the appropriate subdivision, this is also going to have the same property. Right? So, so everything's good. Now the big part comes in is what is the discretization of this? What is the curve fold? Right? So what we have done is at these strips, we haven't characterized the fold. Again, this is a very classic and known result, but it's very beautiful. 
So here is a curve. Okay, this is continuous setting. In the curve, all you need to know is one surface, one side of it, and the line. Right. Even if you don't differentiate, don't know differential geometry, I hope I can explain this. Right. So you were sit, you were an ant sitting at this point. Okay, this is your curve. On this side, at that point, there is a tangent plane to this surface. So there is one plane. Okay, the curve has an osculating plane. That's another plane. And on this side, there is another plane. And the plane here and plane here is bisected by the osculating plane. So this is a known property. Why is this good? Because as soon as you have two of this, the third one is known. Right? This is this makes life very easy if you are in the continuous case. If you go to the discrete world, unfortunately, this doesn't carry forward. So this is the discrete strips we have. And now, instead of this reflection, the property we have, it's that that one is in a cone. So it comes as a constraint rather than one. Right? So the optimization get a bit messy. Not messy, but it, it's hard. It's just the nature of the problem. But it's, I have a very clear characterization that it has to be in that cone. Right? This makes things easier. So I can now have the right representation and this constraint at each time you are on, the, on this uh, curve line. And then you can actually optimize. So the, the writing out the corresponding equation is not, not important. We do need um, membrane energy, very much like Bernd was showing. But since we are working with developable surfaces, one of the k is 0. So this is only one k is left. And that also you can characterize based on the strips. Right, so this works out nice. So in this example, the curve is known ahead of time? In this case, the curve is known ahead of time. Okay. So this is the result. So this is the input. You have the scan. There are ways you can find the sharp edges for the curve. Right? And the coloring indicates the four family we have. So this is plain. Right? Um, if I see here, this part is, uh, this part is the cone. Then there is a cylinder, and the rest is the tangent surface. Right? These are the four colors you would see. So this was in back in 2007. We presented this. We were very happy. And if you ever looked at this paper, these lines or these curve patterns were online forever. And I think, um, I don't know if you, anyone tried. I tried many times, and I was only partially successful for the simple ones. Because it's just very, very hard to fold. And this is, comes back to the last part of the talk. Is there a guarantee that you can transition from the flat plane to these, the curve shape? Like <laughs> so, so in this case, we had this important thing that this surface you know has, so this is more like a reconstruction setting. You know this has been made out of paper. So you know it, it, it exists. The general solution, and again, Justin, Keenan, and Amir, you guys can correct if I'm wrong. The general problem that given an arbitrary shape, give me the closest developable one, I don't think this uh, problem is understood. You can set up some optimization to do this, but I don't think this is. I think what Alec is also asking is like, if you start with a flat sheet and you build the folds in and you just kind of push on it, will this thing pop out? And then the answer no, is no. practically, yeah, the sheet bends a little I, I will, I will talk about the, yeah. the, the one that Justin is talking about. This will be the third part of the talk. Okay. Yeah. I don't understand something. Is the discretized surface developable as well? Or just the continuous one? No, the discre discretization uh, has a condition that if you keep subdividing in limit, it gets there. Okay. But in theory, you could not have a developable discrete surface, right? So in, the, in the. You, you can, if you, this comes up, if you have the strips. But for paper, you don't have it. But if you're making out of, say, strips of. Uh, plastic, let's say, glued together, etc. then you can have that type of con concept. But I don't know of any physical realization other than uh, PQ frames that we'll talk about. Um, OK. So let's, that brings to the second part, which is, uh, which I think needs a bit of understanding. But I think it's a general thing which I, I really like and is very useful as a general way of viewing the problem, which is, Many times we have optimization with shapes, and we will hear a lot about this in the next three days, where we are given shapes, but a family of constraints on them. And we have heard various types of constraints over the two days that we have been listening to. 
So what we would do in this abstract framework, which doesn't seem like um, anything other than uh, mathematical tricks, uh, which, which is very enjoyable, of course, but there, there is a lot of benefit, as you will see. Right? So the idea would be I would map shapes, and this is not just developable shapes, right? shapes, to points. Right? And then I would have constraints. So in the case of developable, it's developability constraint. In what um, in shape correspondence we talked about, it can be isometric constraint. If you would want to conformal, you want to preserve angles. So you have various constraints given to you. And these are all nasty nonlinear constraints, right? And then if each shape is a point, then if we have deformations, this becomes a path in this higher dimensional space. So I will use this figure a lot where this is some higher dimensional space where this manifold denotes the, uh, the one that satisfies the constraints. And a point S0 means what was the shape at this point, S1 was here, and the curve was this one. And this, uh, this would get close to what Alec was asking, that uh, this is a path and there are multiple realizations of the path. And if you sample along the path, you can get nice shapes like here. So the setting is rather easy to explain. We have a set of nonlinear constraints given per edge, per face, per element. And the goal is to find all valid shapes. So there is no, no they, they all have to satisfy this. And there is some notion of desirable or con uh, shapes. So we have a map a mesh to a point, as we talked about. A big sort of um, assumption is we don't touch topology. So it's just topology is going to be the same throughout. And I don't know of a single method that deviates from it really in a systematic way. There can be some hacks or some tricks we do, but generally to me, topology is largely unsolved in this regard. Okay. So a mesh of a set of vertices goes to some higher dimension. So if you have 1,000 vertices, 3 per dimension, so this is 3,000, D is 3,000, right? Okay. And now a deformation, if you add to that shape, is a, a deformation vector is just a algebraic notation, is a deformation at each point. So if you stack them up, this D means I am changing the whole shape. Right? This is just an uh, algebraic notation. And there's a distance measure that I will leave out here. And now we have, this is the interesting part. We are given a set of constraints. Right? This can be arbitrary uh, depending on context. So for example, yesterday we saw this PQ mesh where each quad has to be planar. So there has to be a planarity constraint per quad. And how many such constraints will be given based on how many faces you have. Okay. If you want to build a building, you want the boundary, the external boundary to be flat because you, you hope that's, that's the case, right? So that's a constraint involving whichever bound vertices are on the boundary, et cetera. So it's, it's just very general. Okay. So what we are given is a set of M such constraints. Okay. Theoretically, you can say, OK, that doesn't sound bad. Let me intersect all these constraints. Then I get the surfaces we have. This is not advisable, because we're in very high dimension. And if you want to take this algebraic expression and combine them, this is going to be a nightmare if you explicitly do this. We have an interesting version of the problem where the starting se set, or the set st starting object, is not arbitrary. It's something that satisfies them. So we can do a lot of things by staying in the local neighborhood and making sure these are not violent. That's what it is. And the first approach is, so this is all good. For those who want to care about, the difficulty comes from the high core dimension. Right? This is something I, I can't get into details now, but that's a real source of difficulty. So for one particular example, if you are in this PQ mesh, planar quad mesh, each quad is, um, is going to be planar, one way to to sort of uh, have this explicit equation, you take these two diagonals and you see if they intersect or not. If they are non-planar, like in this case, then the diagonals don't intersect and the, this, the, their distance denotes how much non-planar this is, right? So this is one of the case, which is kind of happens to be very simple. Now, if I want to very locally move things, the one I can do is I want to just basic optimization. I want to move in a direction where I violate the constraints least, right? So I want to move orthogonal 
to the gradient of it. In the, in the gradient, it'll go. So this, this is quite simple, right? So I want in the direction t such that all these things are uh, zero. Okay? This would not. This would define my subspace. I can move it. This is a first order approximation, which visually looks like the following. So I want to move in a in a tree that where in a direction t where all these equations are satisfied. So you get five, uh, not five m constraints, right? One for each of them. Okay, so this is again our abstract picture. If you map this yellow line, which is the deformation along the tangent plane, what you get is a deformation for all the vertices. So it's, it's like almost like synchronous dancing. All the vertices are moving such that each face is, is remaining planar. The quad part is trivial, the planar part is interesting. And if you do this, this is showing how well it works. You have the shape A where all of the uh, faces remain planar. And the more red it gets, that means it's more non-planar it's getting. So you can move further and further, and you get more non-planar. Um, I realize there is a slight problem with time, because we <laughs> start a little. Is it OK if we get five, 10 minutes extra, or should I? You know? organizer last time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, I know it's Sunday, and, and you guys have been amazing. It's just, um, how shall we do it? Shall we take 10 minutes extra? Is that OK? Mm -hmm. right. And you should answer as a speaker, uh, as, as I'm a speaker, not an <laughs> organizer. <laughs> OK, so, so this, is, this is the easier part. You can actually do much more than this by not going in the first order, but going in the second order. And then the math becomes a lot more scary. Um, Essentially, you have the tangent component, but then you have also the osculant component. Or the, uh, it's, you can think of this as Taylor expansion, but in the high dimension, these are unknowns that you have to solve for. Believe me, they can be solved. Right? And then this yellow curve is now the, uh, the, it's a curve, it's not a straight line. And now the vertices are moving along this curve one. Right? And the behavior is as you would expect. You can, we can go further by staying low in error. This is, this is a, like a beautiful explanation or, de uh, or demonstration of power of Taylor series. If you okay. um, I will skip some of this part here. It's, um, so let's see here. So, so this is going to show me this. Um, there's a lot of things happening here. The, if I stay inside the black boundary, I will mean the good region. And there will be two of them, either osculant on the tangent. And you'd expect the tangent region to be smaller, because it would break more easily. Yeah. So is that some projection? This is a projection using a basis of spectral basis, very similar to what we saw in the morning, but in a very different domain. Right? So it's a still spectral basis or the Laplacian basis of this shape. And as you move, this is already an embedding that lifts you, and you stay inside blue um, unless you cross the boundary. And when you switch to tangent, when you see to tangent, you see that the region is smaller. Right? And you can use this. So that this gives a very low dimensional representation of the good space, and you can use it for deformation. And, um, a few years back at SGP, Bailin has a really nice paper of, of carrying this idea forward and doing it with sparse set of re and, and local deformations. So what we can do with this, you drag and you can deform, but it's not like the traditional mesh deformation. Now all these uh, quads are planar. Okay, so this is by construction. You can go much more fancy. I'll, I'll show here um, m different constraints where. I don't just want things to be planar, but also circular. And this is not just esoteric. Circular has some good frame structure, et cetera. And the boundary to be circles, to be uh, order, et cetera. So there are lots of constraints here. And if you see here, this is, this is the shape. It's very similar. You get, again, a construction like this. And the more you have nonlinear constraints, it gets better and better, rather than any direct approach. And I'll show this um, one. Final one with a flat mesh. This is uh, the flat mesh structure. Again, you see here. And the designer, th so this is the goal is to simplify design, right? So the designer designs, and there is no projection step in the end, because it's always staying in this. 
And when he or she is happy, this was an architect, real architect using it. Uh, he's also from, he is from London, and this is the final surface you get, right? Um, this is a difference between those of us in geometry versus architecture. You look at the mesh, and, uh, that doesn't look so good. And then as soon as you render, it just looks very, very different. <laughs> okay, so, so that's a bit. And then now I come back to the third part. Uh, this is the most exciting uh, part, I think, and the most recent part, which took us a long time to do is, can we help in folding these shapes, right? And you'd see that the two parts of the talk will come together. So the goal is, from here, how can we get the folding? And um, this is again related to London, because in London there is this company called Robofold, which has been working for years now on coming up with robots and manually defining the suction curve and, and parts to really deform it. So they would, uh, they're really up to after car bodies, so they would do practical and physical experiments and try to map that to robot parts. It's extremely tedious. We thought, okay, can we do something simpler to this? Okay. So there are two parts to it. One is what Alec was asking, given this fold, can you find the shape? This is something we explain in the paper. I'm not talking about that. So for the talk, assume that this path we have somehow computed. You can look at in our paper how this is computed. And now I can go a little bit faster. So what I have is the initial shape and the final shape. This denotes time, so I'm moving. So this is my initial page, this is final, and anything is between is as a shape, right? So this diagram should be familiar now, right? So the ST0 is here. There's two questions. Um, how can we fold it? And the way we are going to fold it is we will come up with a network of strings that, that if we pull, it will fold it, okay? So to do this, I, I have to run a little bit fast. To, to do this, the idea would be which points to connect and how to connect. That's uh, the main idea. I will explain the main crux of the algorithm. So what we have is the whole shape, right? Uh, along with its movement. So at any particular time, so this time, T0, I actually know how it should move, right? So at each point, I can draw this orange arrows, okay? Because I know the path. So in, and I know that at, at, at any time. So this equation just indicates this path, which is at any time how you're locally falling. Okay. Now our whole problem reduces to the following one. How can we approximate locally this path by a connection of strings? Okay. Now here's um, the main idea is, first I'll explain with uh, intuition, then with this figure, and then with equations. Right? You can, uh, hopefully one of them will be understandable. So, so this is the structure right now, and the goal is if I pull it slightly, will it follow the path? Okay. The main uh, idea that took us months to realize is locally the idea of these four strings, if you shrink by delta, that we can understand by studying the effect of delta by four, but essentially delta, on each of the strings individually. Okay, this was a great realization. But as soon as you realize that, and uh, the, the, the explanation why that's true is again from Taylor series. If you have enough of them locally, you can approximate with this. Then the problem is, which string should I have? So if I have a collection of strings, I have to sub -selection a, select a subset of strings such that we can explain the desired deformation. This gives a rise to a very different concept of bases. Now the bases are string bases, not the Laplace Beltrami eigen bases. At any point, it's, it's, it's something very unique to this particular part, right? So that's the basis. So now that's all I need to explain this figure. So this orange arrow is in the shape space arrow of all of them. And the green denotes what's the action of pulling this string, this string, this string, this string. So we have, this, these are the bases. The question is, which are the minimal set of bases I should have so that I can add them up to get this vector, right? As soon as you realize that, there are lots of machinery to do this. So we can compute our eigenmodes, and then I have to solve these which strings, the lambda i's to do this, and then this becomes a very standard optimization problem, okay? So just as an example, so here's that set here, and you can see this orange one. These are the desired one. These are the different modes. 
So x1 means if I just pull this, what is the deformation for all of them? Right? And it's symmetric, that's why x1 is same to x2 to x3, etc. Or if you take this one, etc. Et and if you solve it, it says x5 plus x6. So one solution is this and this together, right? And that's uh, that's the solution you have here. Okay. So let's uh, go to the results. Almost there is one slight uh, but very important trick is. This has to be the selection of strings has to be consistent over the length over the path. This makes uh, impo this is important. Otherwise, we can't have it. We can't have different strings for different paths. It has to be consistent. You can also write it in the equations. We'll leave it. Okay. Let's see some results. And I have three results, and then I'll hand it over to Bern. So this is the computed one. <coughs> and you see here. This is the structure you, you get to see. Uh, this is still the rendered one. We'll see if I can speed it up a bit. Okay. This you believe. This is more for an illustration. There's some implementation details. I'll so this is the second one, which I will start the video, which is here. It's a long video, so I can't show the full video. The thing uh, with the strings, these are so thin, I can't really see very well. So you see here, and you can see how it, it folds. Right? And it follows uh, the path very well. Note that there is no IFEM simulation or anything underneath. It's it's everything's geometric, and as you pull, you would, you would see how it is. It's really there are these stoppers, because otherwise this will come and hit here. So as you see here, this is without stopper. And this is with the metal sheet that you did. And it goes on. I want to show the last bit. So this is something we did. And this is a, a complex one. I'll run it. And this is the last video. And then I'll, I'll give it. So this one is very hard to do, as you can see here. This is uh, how it sits. Because it, there's a lot of intersection, self-intersection that happens. So you have to get it right. And I was stupid to print a small sheet. If I had a big sh sheet, then it would be easier. Um, but this is the final shape, as you would see here. So this is as happens. This is a bigger model, so it's easier to see what's going on. Okay. Um, with that, I will um, hand it over to hand it back. Um, uh, but you can download the models and everything else from our web page and, of course, the papers if you want to know more about this. Thank you.